Ele No rider, huh? <laughs> Welcome to the episode of Jay Long's Garage Pandemic Edition, the car featuring today 1972 Citroen SM. Uh, this is a car, well, I've had this car about 35 years, and early on, before we were on YouTube, we did a short video of this car. Uh, so it's why we haven't put it up here, because we had a video on it once, but it was only like four minutes. And reading the comment section, uh, you guys have seen it parked over there in the background all these years where that's where we was parking. And uh, I kept getting requests, could you show that one again? So I thought we'd pull it out just like we did the Monteverdi a while back and, uh, and do a, a longer version of it and show you some of the unique features of this car. Just an amazing automobile. When this car came out, well, it's a 2.7 liter V6 four cam Maserati engine in a Citroen. You know, Citroën has always been innovative as far as style, handling, engineering. Not so much the engine. The engine's always been sort of pedestrian at best. Uh, the DS that was supposed to have a flat six that uh, didn't work out. They just put a regular water-cooled four-cylinder engine in it and a little underpowered. It was okay. It was okay. Uh, so. They wanted to build a luxury car. You know, Citroën had well over 30% of the market in, in uh, France. And they built two CVs and all sorts of, well, even the DS is a luxury car, but they also built a cheaper version. They wanted some high-end, you know, uh, England had Jaguar, Switzerland had, had Monteverdi, America had Cadillac, Germany had Mercedes-Benz. They wanted a Citroën up at that level so they come up with this the sm it is a four seater with a five speed what happened was they realized the engine they were developing just wasn't going to work so they looked at maserati they loved the maserati v8 but they realized that was too long to fit under the hood so they needed something a bit shorter and maserati was in trouble so citroen bought a controlling interest in maserati uh, they liked it so much they bought the company. It was one of those sort of deals, you know. And uh, they developed this V6, which I heard two schools of thought. Some people say it's just the V8 with two cylinders lopped off. Others say no, that is actually developed separately on its own using a lot of the V8 uh, engineering. You know, a V6 is not inherently well balanced, so it took a little, little time to do it, a little tricky, but they did it fairly quickly. And as I said, I've had this car 35 years, runs, drives perfectly. This was the first, quote, foreign car in America to win Motor Trend's Car of the Year. And it wasn't just like it was a couple of guys from Motor Trend. It was a very distinguished panel of which Phil Hill, America's only world champion, was one of the judges. So that'll give you some idea of how seriously they took it. And it was such an innovative automobile. The trouble was, and this is the story I heard, that the editor soon got fired for picking this as the car of the year, because unlike an American manufacturer, Ford, uh, uh, American Motors, General Motors, GM, when they got car, they, oh, they'd run full page ads, car of the year and buy advertising time, where Citroen, they, they, oh, thank you very much. They, they couldn't have cared less. <laughs> they didn't really buy any ads. And the, the publisher felt they lost a fortune by picking this car. But they picked it because it was the best car. It was also the world's fastest front wheel drive car. Prior to this, the world's fastest front wheel drive car, surprisingly, was the Oldsmobile Tornado of 1966. I think that had a top speed of 123 miles an hour. This was closer to, uh, I, it varied between 137 and 142, but that's, that's really quite fast. This car features Citroen's famous, innovative hydropneumatic suspension uses nitrogen gas and this green fluid to, well, give you the best possible ride you could imagine. I mean, it is amazing what a smooth riding car this is. You go over potholes, you can't, you can't tell. This system was so good, Rolls-Royce licensed it because they couldn't come up with anything better. I believe Mercedes-Benz also licensed it as well. I know for a fact Rolls-Royce did. And uh, it really works quite well. Uh, it has a lot of bizarre features. It takes a little getting used to to drive one of these. Because the pneumatics did the suspension 
It also does the power steering and it also does the brakes. So this isn't like a regular car where you've got to change brake fluid and all that kind of stuff. There is no brake pedal. There is what they call a mushroom. It looks like a little button that's on the floor and you apply pressure to slow down. You've had this, it's the first car to have uh, rain sensing windshield wipers. You know, in France, anything over 2.7 liter was considered sort of a big engine and subject to a huge tax. You know, before the war, the French built all these magnificent cars with engines of five liter, four liter, three and a half liter. And then after the war, they, they realized, no, they wanted more, quote, people's cars, regular automobiles, not so much the luxury class. And that whole segment of the market disappeared from France altogether. So for Citroën to build a luxury car, if it was over 2.8 liter, which is the limit, it was over that, the tax would have been oh, just crazy. So they went with this four cam. It was 170 horsepower. This was certainly not the fastest accelerating car out of there. The coefficient of drag on this car was 0.26. And I can attest to that. When I drive this on the freeway and I take my foot off the gas, I freewheel. It's not really freewheeling, but it feels like it because you're literally cutting through the air so swiftly it doesn't slow you down. You know, when you drive a big car like a Cadillac or something with a big front end, and even the Countach, which has a uh, coefficient of drag well in the fours, you take your foot off the gas and you feel the wind whoo, slow. This cuts right through. Also, this is the only car I have that I can drive in the rain without using the wipers because it literally just sort of beads off. I mean, there's a little bit of rain on the windshield, and of course I do run the wipers, but you don't really need them quite as much because the aerodynamics of it. It's got a cam tail, which was pretty revolutionary back in the day because Pete Brock was one of the first guys to use that. You know, people think, oh, it should taper off. No, the cutoff tail was actually more aerodynamic. And it has, uh, what do they call the steering? Uh, it means diva, device, something like that. But the faster you go, the less power steering you have. Meaning, so at parking speeds, there's no feel at all. And the faster you go, the more feel you get. I mean, it's really fascinating. You also have, the all, wheels always come back to center. If you park this car with the wheels turned, they will come back to center. I did that once, I, I parked it towards the curb and then I walked away and I saw it rolling down a hill. <laughs> so I quickly jumped in it and stopped it. But other than that, it's pretty cool. And it's got the best five-speed transmission at least stock I've ever used in a car. It shifts so smoothly. It's such a pleasure to drive this car. And it gets good gas mileage. But at the time, this was the same price as the top of the line Mercedes-Benz, uh, probably about $14,000 in 1972. By the time you're out the door, I think it listed for like 12 and change, something like that, which was a lot of money. Uh, when I was a kid, I worked for a foreign car dealership called Foreign Motors in Boston. And in 1971, the Rolls-Royce Corniche, I believe, was $29,900 something dollars. And that was like the most expensive car you could get, so that shows you how long ago that was. Uh, anyway, with these wheels that were uh, sort of carbon-infused plastic, it predates carbon fiber, but it was a very light, light wheel, and it was revolutionary as well. So this thing weighed 3,100 pounds, so it literally, like an arrow, cut through the air. It is so relaxing, so much fun to drive. Wind noise is, well, not non-existent. You get a little bit because this rubber tends to get a little bit old, but because of the aerodynamics, just very smooth, very comfortable to drive. Uh, you've got a hatchback that lifts up. Let's open the hood and show you what it looks like under there. Now, this is something, if you pulled into a gas station in America in 1972 and asked uh, the guy to check under the hood, oh, he would be, he would just, well, here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. This doesn't look like any American car at all under the hood. Oh, uh, hey, this is something that would frighten any gas station attendant in America because it doesn't look like anything they've ever seen before. There's your four cam V6 back there. Your transmission is forward of that air conditioning here. These here look like something from 
some science fiction movie from the 50s, Day of the Triffids or something. But what they are, these are your suspension pneumatic system. This top of the globe is filled with, uh, with nitrogen and there's fluid below. And obviously you can't compress the fluid, so the nitrogen will compress. That's how the hydraulic system, or the pneumatic hydraulic system works. You've got shafts and belts. I mean, it's very complicated, but it's still just a car and it, it, it can be worked on reasonably easy. It's just that a lot of people didn't have the time or patience. And I somewhat blame Citroën because they did not really, you know, they didn't really service the American market very well. I don't believe they taught a lot of the mechanics the correct, they just sold these cars and you were sort of on your own. You see this here, this little, this turns, these headlights turn. I retrofitted the European system and in America, for whatever stupid reason, you couldn't have headlights that move. They had to be stationary. Whereas this, these headlights turn, we go around a corner. You cut this wheel, these two outer lights remain stationary, the inner lights turn. So it literally lights the turn so you can see if there's somebody there or if there's a tree or whatever it is. And it's just brilliant, but they were illegal. So those had to be fixed or taken off in America. Uh, I found a European system and I, I, I put it in and it, it's just the greatest thing for night driving. It's so far ahead of anything we had, certainly back in the day. And this car still looks modern. I think you could put this body style out today and people would find it uh, attractive. It doesn't look like, a fifth, look at any other car that's 50 years old and they look old compared to this thing. Battery is down here, we run a modern uh, Optima battery because there's no gas or acid from that. Uh, there's your green fluid goes way up in there. You fill you fill that up with that special. You know people make the mistake. I'll just use transmission fluid. No, you have to use Citroen's own brand of fluid. It's the only thing that works. And if you just pay attention, do the maintenance the way it's supposed to be. Don't modify it. Don't have somebody tell you they can make it better. Just put it back to stock and it'll last you, well, it's lasted me 35 years and I've never had a really a big problem with this at all. We have a guy here named Jerry Hathaway who is the, well, he holds the world's record for the fastest Citroen, well over 200 miles an hour. And uh, he's sort of the guru and he's helped me maintain this car and does a wonderful, wonderful job. So I, I wanna thank him. Okay, let's give you some idea what's happening under the hood. Let's move to the back of the vehicle. Okay, here we are at the rear of the vehicle and you, uh, you probably can't see the heated uh, wires in here. This could defrost the rear window, which is common now, but was pretty cool back in the early 70s. This is SM World. That's the name of Jerry Hathaway's uh, uh, Citroen shop that he used to have. He doesn't have it anymore. Sounds like some sort of sadomasochistic thing, but no, SM World, you say, I'm going to SM World, really? Well, no, no, it's a car place, oh, okay. But let me show you the trunk, or the hatchback, I guess, press this, stood up. You probably, you got a good, good sized trunk, oh, here's all my green fluid in here. This is what you use. Uh, LHM plus fluid, oh, yes, 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 oh, yes, yes. And like wine, you can, no, you don't drink it, don't, don't. Don't drink it. Um, okay, let's put that back in there. Just a car cover, have a full spare with a jack. This car is held up very well. I mean, the chrome, everything here, paint, everything original. Uh, I take care of it. I drive it, I do routine maintenance on it. You know, if you keep these things stock and you try not to get them well, most people can't avoid rain. Here in California, you don't get it that often, but I rarely even wash the car. I pretty much just wipe them all down and that keeps water from getting in to places down in here and other places like that where it can cause corrosion. Come on, let's take a look at the inside. This is one of the most inviting interiors. You know what's so funny? American cars in the 70s, I think some of the worst American cars actually were built 
in the 70s. I, whatever the reason was, we didn't carry them all. We thought we had the market soda. And some of the most fascinating European cars started to be uh, evolved from the same. I mean, look at this dashboard. This is contemporary even today. You know, there's no silly velour upholstery like uh, a lot of GM cars had from the 70s. Just horrible. I love this single spoke steering wheel so you can actually see all the gauges. You know, most cars that have three spokes like this, you, you couldn't see the gauges. Uh, you've got your radio down here. I was like a sidewoods radio. I think Corvette sort of started that in 1963. Got your ashtray here. This is something I just added. This just tells you how many volts we're putting out to make sure it's uh, it's okay. Now it's parked right now, it's 12.2 volts, so that means my battery is good. Handbrake, you got air conditioning here, you have a clock, you've got your glove box here, and you have oh, a secret glove box here. Look at this, huh? Officer, no, I don't have anything bad, no. And then you open this and you see, you got a whole, and you got a separate one over there. Uh, as I say, these came fully equipped with air conditioning, which was unusual for uh, European cars to have that. I'm not sure if it was standard. It's certainly standard in the American model. And look at these seats. I mean, they're just very French. They're just the whole design, the whole look. Uh, what's the guy's name? Robert Oberon, I think that was his name. He was the designer of these cars. Uh, brilliant, just brilliant designer. I mean, I just love this car because even today it looks like the future. You know, you ever notice whenever they show a car from the future, it's always a Citroën. It's always a DS, which was developed in 55, or something like the SM, because it just looks like what people think the future will look like. You've got a full back seat, um, and you can actually get adults back there. I've got these seats all the way back, and there's still room. You've got your suspension control here. You can put this car all the way on the ground or bring it all the way up. This is how you use your height adjustment here. This is the standard setting. That'll bring the car up to normal road height. When you want to be as high as you can possibly go, you put it in the end setting there. And that brings the, the car up. See, if you're in snow, this is what you can do. As you can see, that's quite a bit of ground clearance. Now let's put it back down. Gonna be first low rider, huh? <laughs> Let me put it in the normal driving position. This is about where it would be if you're going down the road. But the cool part is, if you're going down the road and you see snow, or you're going off-road, you're on a dirt road or something, you just put it all the way up. It, I mean, it's pretty cool. The cool thing about this system is it allows you to drive this car on three wheels if you don't have a spare, your spare is flat as well. The way you change a tire in this is you put the suspension all the way up, you put the jack underneath it, and then you drop it down, and that raises that wheel. We'll take this thing next door, put it up on the lift, and I'll show you what it looks like underneath. Okay, we've got it up on the lift. I've got my flashlight, as you can see. Uh, it is pretty smooth, pretty clean aerodynamically under here. Look at the exhaust system. It is there. You've got these twin pipes coming all the way to two mufflers up here. See how it's all sort of set into the body of it so the aerodynamics don't get interrupted. You know, with most rear wheel drive cars, if you've got a big muffler hanging down, if you're other here, you don't have that. There's your, you can't really see much under the rear here. Let's move towards the front. The exhaust system, it's clean, it's tucked up underneath so it doesn't disturb the airflow. Here's the really cool part. I got my flashlight. Your disc brakes are inboard. You follow what I'm saying here? Your engine is right here. 
here are your disc brakes on each side. Everything happens up front on this car. You've got a couple of drain tubes there. See, the disc is not on the wheel for unsprung weight, or to save, rather, unsprung weight. What you're hearing in the background are airplanes. My shop's right here at the airport. Uh, but it's pretty smooth, pretty clean under here. A few drops. There's your air intakes, a couple of air intakes for your brakes, see? There's your disc brake there. There's your other disc brake there. They can't be more than, what, 18 inches apart, something like that. Pretty cool. Here's your grill, your radiator, your horns, your front brakes. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty, the disc brakes is what really gets me. It's really, really pretty cool. No fun to change but pretty cool engineering. And just a smooth aerodynamic situation happening underneath here. I love the little resonators on the end here. And that's pretty much it. I think it's time to put this flashlight away and go for a ride. As I said, this car has about 110,000 miles on it. A lot of unique features. My favorite one is the fact that this is the world's best rain car. Because when you hit the brakes, the front end doesn't die, the rear end does. The rear end goes down, like, kind of like a boat in the water. This kind of goes down like this, you know? It's really quite cool. Uh, with 170 horsepower, no, it's nowhere near the fastest car out there, but it's certainly one of the most satisfying to drive. You know, when you put your foot in it, Enough torque to pull you along pretty quickly as you slice through the air. I enjoy watching the tack come all the way around. And with a top speed of this about 140 miles an hour, it's, it's, well, like I say, it was the world's fastest front wheel drive car when it came out. An interesting story, earlier in this video, I showed you how the hydraulics work and how you were able to drive on three wheels because you could lift it up, you could lift up one wheel, literally. There was an assassination attempt on Charles de Gaulle. What was it, 12 guys on motorcycles literally firing machine gun bullets at him in his motorcade. His guy, you know, uh, obviously downshifted, took off. They blew out the rear tire. He used the hydraulics, he lifted the wheel, and he drove away on three wheels. I mean, it was, it's exciting. In fact, Charles de Gaulle, after the car saved his life, and he did credit Citroën with saving his life. Uh, he made Citroën the official car of France. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I love this gear shift lever. Beautiful, polished, anodized, I guess you'd call it. They did make an automatic. I don't know why anybody would buy that. To me, the joy of driving this car, it's such precision. That's a great, listen to it, great sound. It's quick enough, and it feels fast. Obviously, it's not gonna blow the doors off a Corvette or a Maserati or you know, anything like that, but it's just different. It's, it's a different kind of car. If you were a wealthy family guy back in 1972, you had a wife and kids, and a two-seater car was out of the question, or a sports car was out of the question, this was a good family car because you could go anywhere with it and you put the kids in the back and these seats are really comfortable. And the steering, look at, just, see, it will always come back to center. See, you leave the wheels like this, it won't, I got my foot on the brake, and it's not, always goes, goes back to center. And the faster you drive, the less power steering you have because it's, it's, uh, it gives you back more road feel. Park like this, ugh, you, can, you can turn this wheel with one finger, no problem. Almost like one of those, you know, Chrysler Dreamboat cars of the 50s, you know, that power thing. But then as soon as you move in, you get that real road feel back again. France was never quite obsessed with Nürburgring the way other manufacturers were, they were more about getting to Nürburgring comfortably and in style. And this thing's got a lot of style. 
it's really timeless. Robert Oberon, I hope I'm saying his name right, Robert Oberon, was a genius, just a genius, just a brilliant designer. The French do style so well, nothing garish about this car, nothing where you go, oh, what is that, you know. I mean, I, I consider 1958 probably the worst year for style in American cars, because they just put the chrome on with a trowel, you know, giant chrome bumpers, giant chrome everything. Uh, the French always did it just, just perfectly. The French, you know, you sip wine, here in America you drink a 44 ounce big gulp, you know. Now I talked about not modifying these, so, so, so I don't sound like too big a hypocrite. My friend Jerry Hathaway uh, came up with a proportioning valve, so this doesn't lean quite as much. That's taken a lot of the lean out of the uh, hydropneumatic suspension system. So, uh, which I like, makes it handle a little bit more sporty. But other than that, the car is completely stock. They came out with a carburetor, uh, yeah, this is a carburetor version. I think by 73, 74, they came out with a fuel injected version. The thing that really hurt the Citroën, why they only built 12,000 of these, their market for this car was America. And Citroën had been led to believe because they were a smaller manufacturer, at least in terms of American manufacturing, that they could get an exemption for the impact absorbing bumpers, which I guess were mandatory from 74 on. So they just thought, okay, they can build it this way. There was no way you could put those giant, stupid impact absorbing bumpers on one of these. And they thought they had an exemption. Well, literally a month or two before they were said, that, no, they, America said, no, you can't bring it in. And they were like, really, that's it? So all the SMs that were destined for America were sent to Japan and let's sell them over there. And it was too bad too, because I think we mixed it out on something brilliant. These turning headlights are a revelation, especially in the early 70s. You know, when I first got this car, it was great. I'd be on Mulholland Drive, which is the windy road up here in Los Angeles, where everybody goes. And I cut the wheel, and I could see into the corner before I got there. I mean, I had never had that happen with an automobile before. It was amazing. I mean, you've got big windows here. You've got this greenhouse effect, which is very nice. You know, one of my pet peeves with the modern Camaro is I feel like I'm, the window's like a letterbox, and I'm crammed in. Whereas this, you've got nice wide windows. You've got a high roof, even though it's a low car. You know, my, my head doesn't touch the roof on this thing. And I'll show you what I mean, the aerodynamics. When you get off the gas, the speedometer doesn't move. It doesn't drop because you're not fighting that wind resistance. You know, you can't just hop in one of these and drive away. There's sort of a learning curve. The steering will screw you up. People go zigzagging down the road when they first pull away for the first time. And the brakes, you don't, you don't jump on the brakes. You just apply pressure to the floor. You just put your foot in that button and touch it ever so slightly, and you come to a full stop, no problem. And with the inboard disc brakes, unsprung weight obviously reduced. This is a fabulous car for taking a long trip in, because it's really comfortable. It's not like a, a lot of modern sports cars where you just, you know, that Recaro bucket seat is beating you up. It's so tight and confining. I've never had any problem with this engine. You know, people have Citroëns complain about them. And rightly so, because Citroën did, just did not provide the technicians or the, uh, the parts availability or the service. People here didn't understand them. It was unlike anything built in America ever. So it was like a car of the future. And even though it's only 170 horsepower, you do find yourself going, whoa, I'm, oh, geez, I'm doing 80. You know, you don't even realize it. It's about 100 degrees here today in Los Angeles, and the air conditioner works fine. I just had my hand on the dash and made me realize how hot it was. Everybody should drive a French car at least once in their life, just to get the feel of it, just to sense what it's like. It really is. It's not about the horsepower, it's about the whole package. You know, so many American cars are just about the horsepower, drum brakes, leaf spring suspension, but five, six, seven hundred horsepower. And horsepower can cure a lot of problems. I'm the first to admit that. But when you have a well-balanced package like this, ah, it's just so enjoyable to use. Good gas mileage, 
pleasant environment. You know, these were so cheap for the longest time because when they were broken, nobody could fix them. And they just sat and sat. I mean, a guy three houses up from me, he had one in his garage for like 15 or 20 years. Eventually he left it abandoned and I would have taken it, but he moved away. He didn't say where he went. And I guess the car eventually just got taken to the junkyard one day, which was sad because it was a nice one. You know, I believe you could release this car today looking exactly the way it does and uh, it would still be successful. Well, that sounds weird because it wasn't that successful when I came out, but I don't think it had to do with the car. I think it had to do with the circumstances. You had that big gas shortage in the 70s, OPEC and all that. Nobody wanted to buy what was then a thirteen dollars or $14,000 car. Uh, it seemed wasteful, you know, all sorts of reasons, but it's still a great looking car to me. And still a contemporary looking car. I haven't seen any modern cars that are as good looking as this thing. Don't you love those headlights, the way they turn? There are a lot of awful good uh, YouTube videos about the Citroen SM out there. Uh, you should check out some of those uh, as well if you enjoy these cars. I just thought it might be fun to kind of take you for a ride and kind of hopefully share with you the feeling of what it's like to drive it and how pleasurable it is. I mean, again, it's not about the speed. It's fast enough. It's about the handling, the sensation. It's so much of how it makes you feel. And this car really makes you feel fantastic when you drive it. So I hope you enjoyed this. and. Uh, uh, hopefully this pandemic thing will be over soon, but uh, we'll just keep doing these this way and I hope you like them. I'm sorry we can't get a lot of the fancy shots and things we get when we have my camera crew and stuff, but I, I like to keep these videos coming. I'd like to keep, uh, I don't want to break up the rhythm, you know. With this pandemic thing, we lost so much of, uh, of our regular routine, so this is one routine I'd like to keep going. See you guys next week. Thanks a lot.